Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sapa, and today we're investigating another useful and quite technical way of detecting assumption violations in regression modeling, that is, how to detect multicollinearity using eigenvalues, the fundamental concept from matrix algebra. Multicollinearity, just as a reminder, is a condition when your explanatory variables are tightly correlated with each other. And the problem that multicollinearity can introduce into your regression estimation is variance inflation. That is, the standard errors of your coefficients, of your estimators, would be inflated, would be higher than otherwise, and that could lead to type 2 errors, when you fail to reject the null hypothesis of no relationship, when the relationship is actually there. Multicollinearity also introduces a lot of noise into your parameters, and is generally considered an undesirable trait. Previously, we have investigated some other multicollinearity diagnostic tests, such as Faragloba and Haitovsky determinant tests, so please check this video out after this one if you're interested in determinant tests. However, today we are exploiting another fundamental concept from matrix algebra, and that is eigenvalues. To consider this, we first, just as in previous multicollinearity tests, have to calculate the correlation matrix between explanatory variables. And in our data set today, we have got our dependent variable, which is GDP per capita growth, and we've got five explanatory variables over here. So we are concerned only with pairwise correlations between explanatory variables, so between those five. And here we can use the index method to efficiently calculate the correlation matrix, so all possible pairwise correlations between those. So we can use the corel function and then the index function on top of that, referring first to the first row of our variables and using the indices to refer to the correct rows and columns, and then inputting the final row of our X matrix over here to finalize the first array that would go into the correlation function. Then we would also need to index the second array that will fit into our correlation function. And here we just change the index to represent this particular cell and change it in the other part of the formula as well. And that quick and nice trick allows us to enforce it throughout and calculate all 25 correlations. We see that the correlation matrix is symmetric. Uh, we have got quite small magnitudes of correlation coefficients. However, there are some uh, pretty high, in terms of magnitude, coefficients that could theoretically pose a multicollinearity concern. So how to proceed from here, how to use eigenvalues and what those are to start with, uh, to detect or reject the existence of multicollinearity? Well, eigenvalues are parameters that, if introduced in the following equation, which involves the determinant of matrix A that we are concerned with, so here the matrix A would be our correlation matrix, and then if we subtract from this matrix lambda, lambda being the eigenvalue, times the identity matrix or the unit matrix of the dimensionality that matches the dimensionality of our starting matrix, and then calculate the determinant of the resulting calculation, we would get zero. That would mean that lambda, the parameter we have introduced here, is indeed the eigenvalue of our starting matrix A. Eigenvalues have a lot of interesting properties. However, here we are interested in only one of them. Here, uh, the spread of eigenvalues would tell us how correlated those variables are together. If, for example, our starting matrix is quite close to being perfectly collinear, then the determinant of this matrix would be quite close to zero to start with, without any subtractions whatsoever. That means that eigenvalues of this matrix would be quite smaller 
than uh, or eigenvalues of a matrix that is further away from perfect collinearity, something that we consider undesirable. And that is actually uh, corresponds quite nicely to the properties that we care about today. We want to calculate all possible eigenvalues and consider what is the smallest one, which would indicate how close it is to uh, perfect multicollinearity. And we would also calculate the condition index, which measures the spread between the maximum eigenvalue and the uh, smallest eigenvalue and take the square root of it. And in practice, we are diagnosing severe multicollinearity, that is multicollinearity that can materially affect the regression results if our smallest eigenvalue is less than 0.01. So if it's higher than 0.01, then we are good to go. And the condition index should be less than 50. If it's less than 50, then multicollinearity is of less of a concern. And if it's greater than 50, then multicollinearity is severe. And we have to either change our model, uh, removing some of the most tightly correlated variables, or use a multicollinearity robust uh, regression estimation. For example, ridge regression that we covered in one of the previous videos. So how to actually calculate all possible eigenvalues of our correlation matrix. This is a quite hard and computationally challenging task simply because a matrix of dimension n by n has n unique eigenvalues. And uh, that would mean that something like goal seek or solver would not potentially pick all of those up. Here we're looking for five unique eigenvalues after all. And uh, if our matrix is very close to being perfectly um, orthogonal, that means regressors are independent from each other, we would look at eigenvalues that are quite close to 1. Indeed, if we consider the fact that uh, our matrix might have zeros everywhere here, away from the diagonal, then indeed the only way how you can get a zero determinant by subtracting lambda times some identity matrix is inputting lambda equal to 1 or something very close to 1. If this condition, those being zeros, is imperfect and they are slightly deviating from zero. However, if there is a notable multicollinearity, some of those values, as we see here, are quite far away from zero, then we can see that if we subtract something quite far away from one in terms of our lambda parameter, we might still get a zero determinant. So that's the logic that we'll uh, exploit here. First of all, we'll consider a range of potential candidate values that can be eigenvalues that can turn the determinant to zero after this manipulation is uh, executed. And the stronger multicollinearity you suspect, the wider the range you should pick, because the maximum eigenvalue that you get is the highest the more severe multicollinearity is. So, for example, if we found some of those values being 0 0.8 or 0 0.9, we could go as far up as considering candidate eigenvalues of 20, 30, or even higher magnitude. However, here, as those values are quite small, we would uh, be fine, potentially, if we consider a narrower range, for example, from 0 to 2. And you need to only consider positive uh, eigenvalues in this case, simply because of the properties of a correlation matrix that rules out negative eigenvalues. So here, to make it efficient and fast, we can use the sequence function, uh, and as we want to move from 0 to 2, and we want some nice granularity here, let's move 1 thousandth um, at a time. So we'll need 2001 rows and one column. We'll start with 0, and we'll move at a step of uh, 0 0.001. That would spit out our sequence, and indeed we'll move up 1 thousandth at a time from 0 to 2. Now we need to enforce this particular formula that would allow us to search for candidate eigenvalues. That would be the matrix determinant, m determ function, of our starting correlation matrix that needs to be locked, minus our candidate eigenvalue, which is the value in the A column, times the identity matrix of dimension five. And that can be efficiently introduced using the m unit function that spits out a unit matrix of given dimension, and here the dimension is 5, because we're having a 5 by 5 matrix to start with. Enforcing this formula, we can see that the determinant of the uh, starting matrix, if a lambda is 0, you just get the determinant of matrix A, isn't it, is 0 0.73. That's quite far away from 0, already hinting towards the fact that multicollinearity might not be 
as CVM as we might have worried. And now we can uh, enforce this formula all the way down and see uh, what is the dynamics of this particular function as we plug in different values of lambda. We see that the graph crosses the x-axis, the zero uh, level, exactly five times. And that is actually what you would expect. You would expect to have five unique eigenvalues for a matrix of dimensionality five. That does match the dimensionality. And here we see that our uh, eigenvalues, all our five uh, zeros of the function, uh, have been captured on the zero to two range. If you would see that you only captured, for example, four or three, you would just expand the range and proceed with the calculation once again. That would mean that you have underestimated the degree of multicollinearity, and there are some quite high eigenvalues you haven't captured using the range here. But in our case, we were lucky. We uh, anticipated the range quite well, and here are the five eigenvalues that we need to numerically assess. So how can we detect uh, whether those eigenvalues are numerically? Well, we can look at sign changes from one step to another. So if we plug in the sign of the determinant on the current step and multiply it by the sign in the previous step, we will get one if the sign hasn't changed, if the sign remained the same, either positive or negative, and we would have a negative uh, one if the sign has changed. And this one, the sign changes if we have got negative one that we care about the particular value of lambda. Because as the eigenvalue is uh, characterized with the graph crossing the x-axis, we could pick the value of lambda when the sign does indeed change. So here we have got a range of all sign changes. And if we are interested in counting if how many negative ones we've got, we would have five of them meaning that we have got another confirmation that we captured all of our eigenvalues. Again, it's five because the dimensionality of our starting matrix is five, and we had five explanatory variables to start with. So now we can quite efficiently uh, spit out our eigenvalues from smallest to largest using some clever uh, matrix and array function in Excel. We can select a five by one array here and use the if function here and only select the values if they constitute sign changes. So if the sign change is equal to negative one, then we would pick the values from the A column, those that resulted in a sign change and those that are approximately equal to the eigenvalues of the matrix and nothing otherwise. But that would actually spit the array with eigenvalues and blanks, so the final step is just to sort this resulting array in the ascending order by row. And that results in a list of eigenvalues from smallest to largest. We can see that the smallest eigenvalue of zero is 0 0.577 and the largest is 1.623, and all of them being unique. So this particular procedure is quite an efficient and intuitive way of calculating eigenvalues of any matrix in Excel. And that could be used even uh, not considering the multicollinearity application. And that does not involve any numerical optimization tools like Solver or GoalSeq, so it's also fast and reliable. Bear in mind that these are approximate eigenvalues and the granularity, the precision with which it calculates those is related to the step you choose over here. So if you want a more precise calculation, just reduce your step. Bear in mind that that would lead to a larger sequence, so you'd need more cells to calculate the same thing with greater precision. And now we can finally proceed with our diagnostic tests. We can calculate the minimum eigenvalue out of those five and see that the minimum eigenvalue of 0 0.577 is much higher than the borderline um, 0 0.01 condition, the critical value that is accepted in practice, meaning that multicollinearity is uh, nowhere near as severe to be worried about it, as well as the condition index can be calculated as the square root of the maximum eigenvalue divided by the minimum eigenvalue. And that leads us to calculate the value of 1.677, which is again way lower than the critical value of 50, again, uh, accepting the null hypothesis of no multicollinearity, or at least no severe 
multicollinearity in our explanatory variables. And that's all there is for diagnosing multicollinearity in your data using the eigenvalue approach with either minimum eigenvalue or the condition index, as well as some clever tricks of how to calculate eigenvalues of any matrix in Excel without any numerical optimization. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.